So how is everyone today? Good. Good? Pretty good. So, written homework zero is basically just, you know, how to, how to do a written homework. Uh, <clears throat> so there was no, no specific task other than the task of successfully printing it out and bringing it here. Uh, terrific. Uh, we'll have, so there's, there's, what, three, I think, written homeworks due yeah. in lab. We'll have about that many due from now on. That'll help you learn how to use MATLAB to do typical math class tasks, and it will also encourage you to attend. Terrific. Any questions about the written homeworks? We're just supposed to be writing scripts, not functions, right? Yeah, just scripts. OK. So besides the written homework, a couple other things <coughs> is that uh, today, <coughs> so I've been through all of your, uh, each and every one of your programs. By the way, that's a lot. Uh, you know, because there's on the order of 40 of you, believe it or not, not, ac not actually present. <laughs> uh, then each one has on the order of 50 assignments. Uh, 50 individual files that you were expected to make so far. And uh, so that, you know, you can multiply that in your head. That's around 2,000 files, so I'm going through them one at a time. That's lovely. So then, uh, <coughs> so the grading is broken into two pieces for each one of your, um, conceptually two pieces for each one of the assignments. Uh, Conceptually, they're called the, <laughs> I call them anyway, the silicon piece and the carbon piece. Which is to say that the silicon piece is the piece that MATLAB grades, right? Which is to say it's that test function that you run. So that's part of your, that's part of your grade, whether or not it passes the test. So I call that the silicon piece because the machine performing that computation is the computer. I call the carbon piece the thing that I'm doing because I'm not the silicon computer, I'm the carbon one. <laughs> so that includes things like making sure that you actually use the correct algorithm, the one that was stated in the exercise. So some lovely things that I discovered is, you may remember at the beginning of the semester when we did those exercises where it was like, okay, I want you to take a number X, whatever number X I give you, and I want you to multiply it by 15 or 16 or whatever. But I don't, yeah, 16. But I don't want you to use the multiplication operator. Rather, I want you to use the addition operator 15 times. Okay, well, the vast majority of you did exactly that, but there's, there's a, few, a few of you who just said, no, I'm just going to use the multiplication operator. I'm just, I'm just going to do it. And, of course, it passed the silicon test, the MATLAB test, because MATLAB is dumb. Right? It, just, it just tests whether or not the output is correct. But then I read the file, and I see that, well, without regard to whether or not the output is correct, you didn't use the correct method. So, I went through all of your files and, and, and did that. Uh, furthermore, <coughs> when you write code in, in the same way that uh, you've learned all your life when you're writing sentences, you know, you've got to have, you've got to have uh, the correct punctuation, you know, periods at the end of sentences, things like that. You've got to have spaces between words, but not too much space because then it looks weird all that kind of stuff, okay, the general formatting of English prose, well, there's some formatting rules corresponding to code also, and I, I wasn't clear about what they, what they were, but now I'm going to be clear about what they are, and you're going to need to fix the formatting. But don't worry, that's, that's one of the most trivial tasks that there is. Okay, and I'll be very clear in what way uh, I deem your code as not formatted. Okay, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a link to a specific rule that you're not following. Okay, so then uh, all of those comments about whether or not you use the right algorithm or whether or not it's formatted correctly and all that stuff, those will all be generated, those will all be pushed to GitHub as an issue. So GitHub as a tool, it's a software 
writing collaboration tool. So the way we're going to use it is that you've written some software. I will, I've reviewed it and will review it in an ongoing basis. If something's not right, then I'll create an issue. And if you, if you selected the option to be notified of issues, then you'll get an email every time I make one on GitHub. Otherwise, you'll need to log in and look at, look at the issues. So the issues is, is are things that you're not getting credit for, things that must be fixed. When you fix them, you get credit. Okay, so no one, no one has lost uh, any points. I wouldn't say that's the right way to construe the situation. Rather, I'm pointing out to you very specifically how you get what points that remain. Okay, so any questions about any of that? <clears throat> yes? Well, maybe you said before I came in on your home minutes, right? but uh, we have to upload our written homeworks to get one. The, a, the script, whatever, whatever MATLAB script you use to compute the results, yes. But not that, not that black and white sheet, not that. Right. So that needs to be turned in physically. Okay, so the script, so what do we save it under <coughs> in GitHub? So, when you, when you look at GitHub, there is a directory in the root directory of your repository called PHW. That stands for print Programming Homework. Okay, then within the Programming Homework directory, there's 000, where you did some kind of barely even an assignment, <laughs> right? And then there's 001, where you did something potentially more interesting. And then all the way down to, <clears throat> What are we at presently? 026? Okay. So then this, that's, from the, that's from the root directory. So what I want from you is I want you to make another directory called WHW. That's for written homework. Within the written homework directory, I want you to make another directory for each written homework except for zero, because there was nothing to do. So you need to make a directory called 01, and then within 01, you make a file named work.m. Work.m. And then in 02, you make another file called work.m. And then etc. You know, supposing we get down to written homework 30. Let's be ambitious. I doubt. Yeah, I, th I think so, yeah. So what's going to happen is that when I sit down with your written homeworks, I'll get all your homeworks sitting there, and I'll check your answers and make sure that they're correct. So for example, one of the homeworks due on Thursday is something silly like, tell me the sum of the first 2370 primes. Okay, well, that, there's some number. I, don't, I have no idea what the number is, but there is some number that's the sum of the first 2370 primes. And in principle, you could just look at your neighbor's paper and just write it down. <laughs> but if, you're, if, you're, the, if the script in GitHub doesn't won't generate that answer for you, then you won't get credit for that. So what I want to see, you know, instead of, instead of looking at your work and grading it on the sheet of paper, I'm looking at your work to make sure that the summary answer is correct, and then looking at the GitHub script to see that, yes, in fact, student did use MATLAB to compute this. And there's no set way to compute it, right? No, it's, it's open-ended. Open okay. I don't want to put constraints upon you. Though I'll be happy to, to nudge you in the right direction if you need nudging. Okay. <clears throat> so, a, a right direction, right? Yeah. Because there's, you know, I'm trying to make it kind of an open, you have enough knowledge about the way MATLAB works to where every one of those exercises has many conceivable ways to, to get MATLAB to give you the answer. Other questions? <clears throat> okay.
Okay, very good. So any questions about uh, the current programming homeworks or written homeworks? Uh, I saw in e-learning, there was a whole bunch of zeros and ones in the grade mm -hmm. book. Is that corresponding to like pass, <coughs> fail, certain yes. criteria? Yes, yes. So, for example, we did the floating point division problem. I can't remember which one that was. But there was a bunch of files with it, right? One of them was fpdiv.m. Another one was fpdiv underscore sign, so that you could get the sign correct dot, dot m. So for each one of those files I checked, right, so in the first place, MATLAB, you have that test function that checks, are you actually computing the result correctly? So for each one of those tests, that you have a zero or one in the gradebook. Okay. So supposing it passes, you have a one, and if it doesn't pass, you have a zero in the gradebook. Then beyond what, those are the silicon grades, the ones that have an S prefix in front of them. The C grades, the carbon grades, the ones done by the carbon computer, that is to say, me, the meat computer. Right? <laughs> uh, those things, I checked each one of your files, is it formatted properly? Did you use the correct algorithm? That kind of thing. Uh, then there's other ones that say, you know, one of them's called abort. You want a zero for abort. <laughs> because if there's a one, that means that, that, I, that the execution had to be aborted for one reason or another. Okay. So that could be, for example, if I deemed your function unsafe, like if you use some some procedure that's not safe. Like, here's the, here's the fun thing about this whole exercise from my point of view, is that, you know, I'm, I'm literally collecting 2,000 different programs, really probably by the end, 3,000 different programs from y'all. And it, it's really in the end kind of unwise to say, yeah, just give me 3,000 programs, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and execute them all, right? <laughs> Let's just see what happens, right? That's a good way to get, you know, diseased, right? So I have to carefully check each one and make sure that everything that you're doing is above board. <laughs> if you're doing something that's unsafe, then I mark it as unsafe and the, and the execution is aborted. The most mundane thing that makes your execution unsafe is that it gets caught in an infinite loop. And so then I mark it as unsafe. Okay, other questions? Okay, <clears throat> so any questions about the specific programming homeworks, like questions about how do you solve the FPDIV problem, or about the sorting problem, things like this. Yes? Sorry, did they, uh, you notify us on GitHub? I will notify you today. Okay, so you'll start doing that? Yeah, I have all of the notifications stored on on a computer. But see, here's, here's the problem, is that I, I, I've generated, at this point, 3,000 or so different written comments. And I didn't want to click on, on GitHub, you know, 30,000 times to get it to do it. So I had to write a program that automatically puts them up to GitHub. So that program's written now, and I'm going to press go today. <laughs> and it's going to, and it's going to, you know, put a whole bunch of, put all those comments on GitHub. So I wrote all the comments first, and then I wrote the program that's going to push them all to GitHub. <coughs> Other questions? OK. So since we're dealing with so much new stuff, written homeworks, fixing formatting, and other various and sundry things, I decided that we'll work on some easy problems this week. So, the first problem that we're going to work on is a game. It's a game you can play uh, that, that even I played as a child. And when I was a child, it was called the matchstick game. Okay. So, the game... You wouldn't say this as a child, but the game is parameterized by two <coughs> non-negative integers. <laughs> okay, so then let, 
let n be greater than k, be greater than 0, <coughs> be integers. So, for example, <coughs> the example we'll use today is n is 20 and k is 4. So conceptually, what I want you to imagine is that we have a pile of matchsticks. And it's a two-player game, so like you and your sibling or something. And the purpose of the game, the purpose of the game is you, wanna, is you take turns removing matchsticks from the pile. You're allowed to remove up to four, which means that you can remove one matchstick, two matchsticks, three matchsticks, or four matchsticks and you must always play, you can't pass. And the goal of the game is to be the last, the last one to remove a matchstick. You wanna be, want be the one that gets to do the last move. Yes? So, so you just take the, oh, are we gonna talk about it first? Or wanna... Yeah, let's, okay. if you are, this is, a very, this is a very common game, so if you already know the solution, please don't spoil it for everyone who doesn't. Okay, so. <clears throat> Let's, let's play the game. Let's see if we can figure out, because there is an optimal strategy to this game. Let's see if we can figure it out. Okay. And then, and then in retrospect, let's see if we can mathematically justify it. Okay. So let n and k be, be integers. You're gonna, you have a pile of n matchsticks. You can remove one, two, three, up to k matchsticks. And you want to be the last one. You want to be the last one to remove. Okay. So I have a question. Suppose that it's your turn <clears throat> and there is exactly one matchstick. Then what move should you make? Take one matchstick. You should take that one and then you win. Right? Yeah. Perfect. So in this case we'll take one. <clears throat> Fine. Suppose that there are exactly two, and, and we're playing with, for this, for this game, we're playing with n is 20 and k is 4. Suppose that there's exactly two matchsticks. Take two. You should take two. Okay. Good. Suppose there's exactly three. What should you do? Take three. <clears throat> Suppose there's exactly four. Take four. You should take four. Now, the reason why when there's exactly one you should take one is because remember, you're allowed to take one, two, three, or four, and you want to be the last one to remove the matchsticks. So supposing the game has gotten to this small to any of these small states, then every one of these is a winning move. Now, here we go. Supposing there are exactly five matchsticks. Then what should you do? Secretly add one. <laughs> <laughs> and, remem and remember, this game, you're compelled to play. Wh which is to say, you can't pass. Take one. So let's think about that for a moment. What would happen if you took one? So if, supposing, let's, let, let me clarify my remark. Supposing you're playing an optimal player and you take one. You'll lose, right? Because if you take one, then there's four remaining and then your opponent will take four. What if you take two? Then there'd be three remaining and your opponent would take three and win, your optimal opponent would take three and win. Suppose if there's five and you take three, there'd be two left. Your optimal opponent will beat you with the move of two. If there's five and you take four, then there'll be one left and your optimal opponent, or any opponent for that matter, <laughs> will take one and win. So this is not a good position, right? This is kind of like a, so if you're playing an optimal player, yeah, this is a this is a bad position. So I'll just I'll just 
you know, write this. Okay. Well, what if there's exactly, uh, what if there's exactly six? Then what should you do? Take one. Why one? Because then it gives the opponent the frowning face. Right. So notice that when there's six matchsticks, if there's six, then if you take one, then now you've handed, the, you've handed your opponent a pile of five. You've handed your opponent a pile of five matchsticks. And, and supposing that you play optimally from there, you're unbeatable. Okay, <clears throat> so you, from here you should take one. <clears throat> okay, what if there are exactly, uh, how many is this now? Seven. seven. Supposing there's exactly seven. Take two. You should take two. Well, why should you take two? So your opponent gets five. Yeah, <coughs> so that you hand them the, <coughs> the frowny face position. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so you should take two there. Uh, supposing there's exactly the next number, eight. What should you do? Take three. Take three. <coughs> because again, if you take three from this position, then you hand your opponent the frowny face position. So is there any question about me, what I mean by that? If there's eight and you take three, then you've given, your, you've, you've given control to your opponent and now there's five. And it doesn't matter what they take, because they must take, there will be between one and four left and then you will win, supposing you play optimally. Okay. <clears throat> Supposing there, what is this now? This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Supposing there's nine, then what? Take four. Take four. <clears throat> Supposing there's ten, then what? You're probably going to lose. Yeah. You're probably going to lose, right? You're going to lose. You're going to lose because what, what are your, from this position where, where there's 10 matchsticks, what are your possible moves? Take one, two, three, or four. Take one, two, three, or four. So if there's 10 matchsticks, there's 10 of them, and you're allowed to take away one, two, three, or four, that means you're going to hand your opponent a pile of nine, eight, seven, or six matchsticks. And if they're optimal, if they're playing optimally, they're going to take however many matchsticks is necessary to give you a pile of five. And then you're, then you're, then you're toast, right? They've got you. Okay, so now, this is a frowny face position. So I think we've, we've drawn enough for you, for for me to ask the following question. What do you suppose is happening here? Yeah. Is that th this, this sequence is periodic. The optimal move of taking one, two, three, four, or crying. One, two, three, four, or crying. Right? The optimal move is going to be periodic. Specifically, the reason is, beca the reason is because <clears throat> that really this is, the, this is the whole game table right here. So this represents the entire game state because <clears throat> all of this right here, with optimal play anyway, let's see, one, two, three, four, five with optimal play reduces away. And what's really happening is that this triangle right here 
is really just a copy of that one. It's really just a copy of that one. So this was with, with we were playing the n is 20, k is 4 game, which is to say you're, you're allowed to take 1, 2, 3, or 4 at every move. And you must take as part of the rules. <coughs> OK. But, but then it's, it has period 5. It has period 5. So what if we were playing the n is 20, k is uh, 3 game? What do you suppose the period would be? Four. If we were playing with a million matchsticks and we were playing with K is 20, what would the period be? 21. 21 right? It's always one more. It's always one more. <clears throat> At any rate, the best move, you, you, you could say it in this way, the best move is if possible, if possible, hand your opponent a pile of matchsticks that is divisible by k plus 1. It, it is properly divisible by k plus 1. So <clears throat> any questions about the game? So to be clear, <clears throat> Let's illustrate a quick game. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So there's fifteen. Fifteen matchsticks. We're gonna have two players, the red player and the green player. The red player goes first. By the way, you should be able to tell me right now, supposing that we have two optimal players, who's going to win? The, so the game, the game is n is, 20, uh, n is 15, because that's how many matchsticks there are, and k is 4. <clears throat> so who, who wins, player 1 or player 2? Okay, let's say that player one goes first. Player two. player two wins, right? Because player one has begun on a frowny face position. Right? Player one has begun on a, fr has begun on a frowny face. <clears throat> okay, but let's, let's ignore that for the moment and just see the way it, it plays out. Let's suppose we're, we have two players that are not, not necessarily optimal. So red plays and says, OK, well, I'm going to take two. And then green plays and says, OK, I'm going to take away four. <clears throat> red plays and takes three. Green plays and takes three. Red plays and takes. So in the first place, if, if red is optimal, then what would red do? Take three, right? Because that would end the game with a win. But OK, let, let's do this. OK. And then, OK, green plays and green wins. So green's the winner. Any question about, about this? So it's fun to play this on road trips. If you have, you know, if with someone who doesn't quite understand, it's a, even an adult, you know, they adults get it eventually, right? It only takes a few minutes. You can play it with children. You know, you can make sure that they're going to win uh, or, or not, right? <laughs> whatever, your, whatever your style is. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Any question about the matchstick game? So now there's there's a you know speaking of you know engineering the game so a child would win right you can actually play the game in reverse so so this game the game that we described is last to take wins 
Last to take wins. Well, you can play you can play the game in reverse, and you can say, okay. Let's say that last to take loses. Last to take loses. So now, now instead of always taking, if there's one, two, three, or four, you always take that many, or you hand your opponent a matchstick pile that is evenly divisible by k plus one. Instead of that, now, what do you need to do? Mm -hmm. Now you need to give them one matchstick, because part of the rules of the game is that is that you you can you can remove one two three four all the way up to k, and furthermore you must move. So you want to compel them to take the last matchstick. So <clears throat> in such a case, if there's exactly one matchstick and you're playing last to take loses, then what? <coughs> yeah, if it's your turn, then you've lost. So this is, this is now the frowny face position. OK. Supposing there's exactly two, what should you take? One. You should take one. Now, we've said it, but to be clear, and try to say it again, why is it that when there's two matchsticks and it's your move, you should take one? You leave your opponent with one. Yeah, you leave your opponent with exactly one matchstick and exactly one move, and then they've lost. OK. So if there's exactly three matchsticks, you should take two. If there's exactly four, <clears throat> you, uh, oops, it should be a dot. <laughs> you should take three. If there's exactly five, you take four, and then it repeats. So if there's six, if there's six and you happen to be playing an optimal player, then you're in trouble, right? Supposing we're playing the KS4 game. Because if you take away, <clears throat> if, you take, if there's six and you take away one, then you've handed the player a matchstick pile of size five. And they're going to take away four then and leave you with one. And you've lost, et cetera. <clears throat> So this is now the frowny face position, <coughs> etc. <cetera. coughs> so it's a, so it's an interesting game that you that you can play. So you can play it with actual matchsticks or whatever rocks, M and M's. You can play it on road trips and things like that. Terrific. Okay. So now I know that. It seemed to me that at least two or three of you had heard of the game before. So what's the mathematical name for this game? Nim. Nim. Okay. So if you, if you really want to get into it and think about it, there's a whole family of mathematical games that are, in this, that are like this, and they're called Nim. These are two very simple versions of the game. You can do all kinds of neat iterations on the game where there's, you know, you could, you could take up, to, there, there's, uh, you know, up to M piles, and each of the M piles has up to N matchsticks, and then from each one you're allowed to take up to K, and there's all kinds of, all kinds of crazy moves. But it's kind of interesting because, I don't want to speak out of turn because I, I don't know everything there is to know about the games, but many of the games can actually be reduced to these simpler games. And many other games that seem not related can be, re can be related to NIM. Interesting. <clears throat> Any questions about the game? So for our purposes, for our purposes, you're, you have to write an optimal player. And your optimal player must always win 
when it starts in a winnable position. So if I start you out in a losing position, then it's not reasonable for, your, for me to require your player to win. But if I start you out in a losing position, and I set you against a player that is not playing optimally, then you, ha you need to win with high probability. So if we play a large game, like with a million matchsticks, and I start you out in a, a position that's not winnable, supposing you have an optimal opponent, then you, then you should still win if you play a suboptimal opponent. If, as soon as they make even one mistake, you pounce on it, and then you win, okay, all the way to the end. Okay. So let's think about that for just a moment. What would you do if you were attempting to play optimally against a player uh, who you don't know if they're an optimal player or not, but you find yourself in a, in, in a position that, that is not winnable against an optimal, optimal opponent? What should you do? Yes? The idea is, I think, to play your best response in each play. So you Okay, but that that just that kind of begs the question because what is the best response? So if we're playing the if we're playing the K is four game, what is the best response if there's five matchsticks? To take as minimally as possible to get most number of turns to them to mess up my game. So always take one. If we assume that there's a random distribution of the mess up. Okay, but what if there isn't? Sure yeah, so for example, for example, let, let's, play your let's play your game and you play your strategy. You be optimal, play optimally, but I want you to always take one if you find yourself in a position that is um, not winnable against an optimal opponent. Okay. <clears throat> What I'm going, so we're going to play the, K is 20, the, the N is 20 and K is 4 game, and I'm telling you right now that I am always going to play 4 without regard to what you do. So there's 20 matchsticks, and it's to you. Oh, I think the right thing to do is what's called backwards induction. Okay. You start at the end, the end desired result, and then with the knowledge of what you're going to do, you backwards induct, you roll back, keep thinking about what's going to happen until you get to the result. That, that's true. That, that's what this table is. <clears throat> that, that's what this di diagram is. But still, let's, let's play because it, it's, illustrative. it's illustrative. So... And we want it so that uh, I win if I end with one, or you win? Uh, let, let's say it's, it's the last who takes wins. The, last the, first, the first game we talked about. Okay. So it's 20 matchsticks to you with K is 4. So notably, I've started you in a, in a losing position. Right. Yeah, you've got to play one. Because that, that was what you said. You said, I'm always going to play one oh, if, I'm in a losing position. if you're in a losing yes, position. Okay, so I'll take one then. Okay. So there's 19, and I, I broadcasted my, my strategy at the beginning. I'm always going to play four. So I play four. Fifteen to you. <laughs> but since you've declared the, what do you call it? I, this, is a, this is a study that's supposed to be game theory, right? And yeah. since you've broadcasted what your strategy is, uh -huh. that changes what the sub game perfect equilibrium is. It, it, it does. It does. But you, you also broadcasted that you're going to play one. So now you play one. Oh, I see. Okay. So <laughs> You played one, and now, there, now there's 14 to me, and I play four without regard. I play four. Ten to you. Nine. I play four. Five to you. Four. I play four, and I win. Yeah. Right? So even if we started with millions and millions of matchsticks, let's say we started with exactly a million, which is also a losing position for you, then we would do this until, until the end, right? You'd say, oh, I found myself in a suboptimal position, so I'm going to play one. Well, then I play four. So here's, here's the interesting observation, is that, is that I'm a constant player. 
I play a con I've, I've said that my strategy is I'm always going to play four. Your strategy is you, you unwittingly also became a constant player. You became the player who constantly plays one. And then you lose to a player who constantly plays four. And notice that this works for anything. You could say, well, okay, I'm always going to play K. Then you lose to a player who always plays one. If you start in a suboptimal position. And then generally, generally, suppose you're always going to play A. If, if you find yourself in a suboptimal position, then you lose to a player who plays B. Where a, plus one, where a plus B is K plus 1. So, so, back to my original question. Suppose that you're playing a game, a large game, and you've started in a, and you find yourself in a suboptimal position. I think, I think I've established that there's at least one player who can beat, one, one, one dumb player who can beat the, the always play one strategy. Okay, so what's a, what's a, so that's a strategy, but it would lose to the one I said. You could randomize it. Okay, you could randomly select. I think for a sufficiently large <coughs> initial um, stack, mm -hmm. that if you just keep picking random numbers, you know, and assuming that your opponent is playing suboptimally, you're eventually going to get to a point where you're in a winning position. Okay, so play randomly. If you find yourself in a suboptimal position, play randomly. Okay. That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting strategy. Maybe we should be precise and say a uniform choice of those. Right. To, to choose one, uniform. They could, they could favor one or the other. Right. So interesting. If there, are, if there are enough matchsticks and your opponent's playing sub up, they're not going to notice if you add one more into the new <laughs> yeah. position. <laughs> yeah. Just sneak one in there. <laughs> one up the sleeve. Yeah. Well. Someone else is keeping track of the matchsticks, right? MATLAB. Okay. So interesting, right? Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about that game of NIM? So you're going to have to program an optimal player, and your optimal player must always win, supposing that it starts in a, win in a, in a winning position with optimal play. And it must... Uh, almost always win if, even if you start in a lo losing position and you're playing a suboptimal player. So that is to say you should always detect when uh, when the other player has made a suboptimal move. Okay. <clears throat> Another game. So almost everyone has heard of this game, one way or another. Cartesi. <laughs> not, not that one. <clears throat> so, I'm going to describe the game. It has a, it has a, it has a, a title that I suspect many of you already know, but I'm going to not say the title until someone, someone gets it. Okay. Suppose that there's two players. They cannot communicate. And the game consists of the following. Each of them must make a decision. There it is. <laughs> it didn't take long. Each must make a decision. <clears throat> and the decision is, the way I'll construe it, is cooperate or defect. Okay. So I'll I'll describe it out loud first. So 
let's say that there's there's uh, two players, and <clears throat> what's going to happen is they're going to make a decision, and they're going to receive, depending on depending on what which decisions were made in total, each player is going to receive a payoff. Okay. In the case that both players choose to cooperate with each other, presumably, but let, let's, say, let's say it's with each other, then each one gets a payoff of, say, three dollars, if you like, or sugar cubes or whatever. They each get a payoff of three. Player one gets a payoff of three. Player two gets a payoff of three. <clears throat> Supposing that one of the players, either one, chooses to cooperate, but the other defects, which is to say that one of them says, yeah, yeah, I'll work with you, and the other says, no, nah, it ain't happening. Okay, so one of them cooperates and the other defects. Then the defector, the defector is going to get five, which is better than having cooperated. And the cooperator is going to get nothing. The cooperator gets zero. Notably, I'd like for you to observe that when both players cooperated, the total payout over all players was how much? Six. The total payout was, was six, whereas when there was one cooperator and one defector, what was the total payout? Five. Which is less overall, less for the group, but better for the defector, right? And then in the case when both defect, when both defect, they each get one. Okay. <clears throat> so that is to say that Two players, each one independently without being able to communicate with the other, each one needs to decide, I'm going to cooperate or I'm going to defect. If there's two defectors, that's the lowest possible payout of one each for a total of two. If there's one defector and one cooperator, that's a, pay a total payout of five with the defector getting five and the cooperator getting nothing. And then if both cooperate, the total payout is six with each getting three. Okay, so it's, this is called the prisoner's dilemma because one of, one of the most famous w versions, right, stories, is where you say, okay, there's two, there's two uh, alleged criminals and they've both been caught and they're in separate rooms and <clears throat> they can't communicate and then the, the prosecutor says to each one of them, uh, well, here's the deal. I'll just lay it on the line. Is that if you'll tell on your buddy, you'll get off light. But, but here's, the, here's the deal. Is that if neither, one, if neither one snitches, then they each get one year because there's enough to get them on a little bit. So they each get one year for a total punishment of two years. If one of them defects, but the other cooperates with with the, uh, so they cooperate with each other. If one of them defects to the prosecutor and says, yeah, I'll snitch, then that one gets, you know, whatever you like, zero. And uh, the, the one who, <coughs> who wouldn't snitch gets a, gets a very harsh penalty. And then if they both snitch, then that's the worst penalty of all. <laughs> so it's called the prisoner's dilemma. It's called a dilemma because it, it's, not, it's not actually, it is sort of, conceptually a dilemma, but it's not mathematically a dilemma. But it's a notable circumstance because of the following sadness. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's do it. Let's draw the payoff table. So, player one, <clears throat> player two, Each one of them has an independent decision. Player one can cooperate or defect, and player two can cooperate or defect. <clears throat> Supposing they both, so now I, I'm, I'm, I'm framing it in a nicer situation where it's not pris prisoners and punishment, rather it's some kind of rewards. Okay, so then if both cooperate, if both cooperate, then uh, the payoff is three and three for a total payoff of six. <clears throat> if player one defects and player two cooperates, then player one gets five and this one zero, the other one zero for a total payoff of five. 
Otherwise, it's transposed. And if they both defect, what did I say? One and one? Yeah. So aren't the payoffs reversed on the <coughs> Perhaps. Because uh, uh, they get the, the higher reward for defecting on some of the swap rates, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so player one is defecting, so they get, and, and player two is cooperating. So the defector gets the highest payoff. Oh, sorry, P1 and one top of <clears throat> Yeah, so P, P, this is player one. This, this one is player two. Okay. So now, the question is, is, is what is the optimal way to play this game? Yes? Nash and, yeah, Nash equals over in this for both players to defect. Both players must defect. That is the only rational strategy. And that, that's why, that's why this, at least this version of the game is so sad. Let's consider, what should your optimal strategy be? So in the first place, notice. If, so suppose that you have knowledge beforehand. Somehow, you have knowledge beforehand. You're player one, and you know beforehand that player two will cooperate. Suppose that's known. And you've got, to under, you've got to suspend your human intuition about these things. These are not people, right? And you have no connection to this other player and no desire for to see them succeed at all. Okay, suppose that you know that player two will cooperate. Suppose that's known. What that means on the table is that you are on the first row. Suppose you're on the first row. Then what are your possible payoffs Supposing you're on the first row and you're player one. Your payoffs are three or five. Three or five. Which one are you going to choose? Five. And you must defect. Okay, suppose that you, ha again, have advanced knowledge that player two will defect. <coughs> What does that mean about the table? <clears throat> you either get zero or one. Yeah, oh, you're, you're on row two. You're on the second row. So your, your possible payoffs are zero and one. What is your best possible strategy then? Defect. To defect. <laughs> Which means that this is the reason why it's called the dilemma, is that even if if we, if we come back to the human side of it and say, you actually do know this person, well, how well do you know them, <laughs> right, <laughs> is the question. <laughs> your optimal strategy, in each case, your maximal payoff is obtained by defecting without regard to what the other person is going to do. If you know that they will defect, then you should defect. If you know that they will cooperate, then you should defect. Okay. <clears throat> That's interesting. It's interesting. And, and a little sad. <laughs> so, let's, let's now say, okay, what if we're going to play, what if we're going to play exactly two games? We're going to do it twice, which is to say that we still have the same two players, and, and you're going to play the game twice in a row, and the players can remember the way the first game went, right? So, so if the other player cooperated, then I know that they cooperated, and if the other player defected, I know they defected, and I know what I did. Yes? As repeated prisoner's dilemmas for <coughs> finite endpoint, you always defect no matter what. Yes. The reason is because, let's say that we're playing a sequence of two games, and let's ignore what happened on the first game for a moment. How many games are there left? One more. One game. And we've already talked about what if there's one game. So on the last game, on the last game, what is your optimal strategy? Defect. Defect. And you know that the other player knows that too. So what if you're playing 500 games? On the 500th game, your optimal strategy is? Defect. Defect. But you know the other player knows that, so what's your optimal strategy on the 499th game? 
defect because you know what they're going to do. A rational player will defect. That means, and what I want, what I want you to see is that this is true for any finite number of games. <laughs> it's true for any finite number of games. If you if you're playing the Prisoner's Dilemma game a million iterations with another person and, and you know beforehand that you're going to play exactly a million times then the optimal strategy is to defect. Yes? Might there exist some strategic move <clears throat> where as you declare that you will copy their move from the previous time? That involves communicating Yeah, that involves, that involves communicating beforehand. And it's, it's not optimal for the reasons we just said. When you get to the last game it's all, the optimal strategy is always defect, which means that you can, you can excise the last game from the list, which means that every game is the last game. So now here's the one that you're remembering. Let's say that we, we're playing the, the dilemma game, and we're going to do it over and over again, and we can remember what has happened. We've got a good memory, but we don't know how many games we're going to play. This is, now this is different. This is a different scenario because you can't, you can't inductively go backwards from the last game and say, I know on the last game I'm going to defect. And therefore on the second to last I will defect all the way down to the first. Suppose you don't know when the last game is. Now the optimal strategy is completely different. And now we're starting to get to something that's close to the way life actually is. Is that when you're, when you're around people who are your same age, and, and, and it, that has to be true for reasons that I want you to think about, around the same age and the same resources, and you have the ability to cooperate or defect, now what's going to be the optimal strategy? So you were saying it. It has a name. Do you know its name? It's called tit for tat. It's called tit for tat. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, that, I mean, I, that is a strategy just by virtue of you having said it, I, I, but I don't, I don't, that might, I, I believe you that that is, is its name, but it's certainly not the optimal one. Okay, so then, <clears throat> so now, what I want you to observe about this, so I need to write this down, right, this is not a game of my design, this game predates me and all of us by a long amount of time. So prisoner's dilemma, die lemma. Like this? Is it die lemma? It looks close enough for me. I think we all know what I mean anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so this is true. So this analysis is sadly true for any sequence of games, any finite sequence of games. <clears throat> where the number of games is known in advance. Because again, like we said, the optimal strategy on the last game is to defect. So you can remove it from consideration. Then the new, op the new last game has the same optimal strategy, defect. So let's say we're going to play the game over and over again, <clears throat> but we don't know how many games there are. So we've got the iterated prisoner's dilemma. with an unknown number of iterations.
So let's imagine here with that same payoff table. So there's two players, and let's say, just for sake of argument, that there's going to be 100 games, but neither player is privy to that. If they were privy to that, then, then they're both going to defect every time. OK. <clears throat> well, suppose we have an unconditional cooperator versus an unconditional defector. And we're going to play 100 games. The cooperator's eventual payoff will be 0. The defector's eventual payoff will be 500. If both could manage to cooperate every time, then they each would get a payoff of 300, because they'd get a 3 for each game, and there'd be 100 games. OK, so then, <clears throat> if you could just get people to cooperate, if you could just get cooperation to happen, then both players could end up doing all right, 300 and 300. So the optimal strategy here, and I'll hedge my bets just slightly, and say uh, a nearly optimal strategy is the following. So it is called, its name, tit for tat. So in the first place, if you've never played, if you have no memory of having played this opponent, so you, you never played him, have no idea, no history with them, then the first move in the tit for tat strategy is cooperate. cooperate. Not even necessary. Well, it's not necessary to directly broadcast it. So. <clears throat> So if you if you opponent is unknown then you're going to cooperate. Otherwise, that is to say the opponent is known then what are you going to do? Whatever they did last time. If they cooperated last time, well, one, des one good turn deserves another, right? And if they defected last time, then retaliate, right? I'll defect against you now. OK. Opponent is known. You copy the opponent's move. So now, the place where this rears its head is in large distributed games where there's lots of opportunities for play, where there's lots of players and lots of opportunities to cooperate and defect. So an example would be something as simple as, to, to quote, you know, uh, a totally trivial example in biology, say, is that. Uh, birds get ticks just like we do, okay? And uh, unlike us, they don't have hands and they can't reach the top of their head. So they can't get up there. So that's a favored spot for bird ticks because they get up there and what's, what's the bird going to do, right? Now I've got a tick. Well, <laughs> another bird can get that, can get at that tick. Right? So then, if you have two birds, one of them could submit to the other grooming it. That is to say, okay, let's, let's cooperate in this way. So I, I need to be groomed, you groom me. Right? You scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's this kind of thing. And then I remember. The last time I needed it, I remember what you did. Did you cooperate? Well, when you need it, I'll cooperate. The last time I needed it, did you defect? Well, I'm going to defect this time. And this plays out in real life all the time in, in all kinds of distributed situations. So on this particular game, 
we're going to do two things. First, we're going to play. <coughs> we're going to play the uh, the one game Prisoner's Dilemma, and I want you to to implement the unconditional defect strategy. But I also want you to implement any other strategy of your choosing, whatever other strategy you like, and see if you can do better than unconditional defection over a large number of iterations. Can you do better? The answer is no. <laughs> but I want you to see that you can't do better. Then we'll play the same game <coughs> of, you know, what if, what if we're going to play a finite but known number of games? Can you do better than unconditional defection then? Okay, it, over a large number of iterations. And then we're going to play the iterated but unknown, unknown uh, size, iterated prisoner's dilemma. And I, I want you to implement tit for tat and, and see how that strategy does. And I want you to implement any other strategy that you like. Maybe I'll, I'll make positions so you can implement three or four other strategies. And you can just see how do they do so now, I have to hedge my bets slightly to say nearly optimal. Because another way to play tit for tat, to, to implement tit for tat anyway, is you could say, okay, well I'm going to be kind of a, I'm going to be a, a mean tit for tatter. So instead of my opening move being cooperate, you know, maybe I'm playing against a rube, a dummy, who's always going to cooperate without regard to what I do. So I'm going to defect on the first move. That way that that way I get that, you know, just, just a little more, I get the edge. And I win the game. You know, so maybe maybe tit for tat could be could be modified slightly by saying, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna open with a defection and then tit for tat. But another problem is <clears throat> is that what if you're playing a regular tit for tatter and you're 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 a defect an, an opening defector tit for tatter. Well, that's a bad situation to be in. Why is that a bad situation to be in? Because you'll just alternate every time. Right. Because if you're playing against a, an, an opening cooperator, then they're going to cooperate, you're going to defect. You get that one good hit at the beginning, that one, that one where, game where you, you defected and they cooperated. You get that one big payoff, and then you both defect from then on. <laughs> just retaliate to the end of time. A different strategy, possible strategy, with tit for tat, is you could say, without regard to what your opening move is, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to open with cooperate or open with defect. Maybe I'm going to forgive. Maybe I'll forgive after a while. So if, I've, if this other player has, has retaliated against me, after I've retaliated against them, say, 10 times, okay, I'm going <laughs> to, okay, I'm just going to test the waters and see if I could cooperate just once, and then get back into the cooperation mode. Because if you're playing a million games, and you find yourself, okay, we, re we, we defected against each other 10 times in a row, but we, we could be playing for a long time, so I'm going to try to cooperate. Well, that might work well for you, because then you could get into the cooperation mode. Okay, so how well can you do? How well can you do? So my plan for this is, is that each one of you is going to implement a number of strategies for the, for the, for the iterated prisoner's dilemma of unknown duration. And then we're going to play them all against each other in a big, in a big game. Okay, and maybe the, maybe the, the winner, like, will get some extra points or something. If you, if you, not necessarily the winner, like absolute winner, but if you can get into the top bracket, right, you're not, ob you're not obviously losing <laughs> terribly, then maybe we can get some bonus points or something like that. And it'll be fun to watch them all play. Okay. Any question about, about the prisoner's dilemma? So there's two games today. There's the, there's the matchstick game, and then there's the prisoner's dilemma. So I encourage you to, to look into Prisoner's Dilemma and the Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma because in the end it's the basis of a great deal of things that you may not realize. For example, as far as we can tell, it is the basis of why human culture exists at all 
That's the only reason why we should cooperate. By the way, I made a remark, and I hope that it stewed in your head for a little bit. Why is it that the basis of human cooperation requires two, two people that are on more or less equal standing, especially not someone who's in the prime of their life versus someone who's old? You can exploit them, maybe, if you have some advantages over them. Well, you know that the, 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 oldness, of, the oldness of them tells you something about when they're going to stop playing. They're going to die before you. As, and that's sad. That's sad, but that happens in real life. Just, just Google, you know, abuse of the elderly, and it, it'll, it's a sad story. Yes? Well, like if you're uh, in a lawsuit with a company <clears throat> that might have more money than you, they can kind of exhaust your legal funds. Exactly. So that, that's why, you know, that, that you have this saying that justice can be bought. Because, yes, if you are, even if you're in the right and you're suing Google, well, you, you're going to run out of moves <laughs> before Google does. <laughs> okay, good. So have a nice uh, Tuesday. See you at lab.